to get started, I get a lot of questions, I got a lot of people curious, especially from kids, of, of how, do you, how do you think as a physicist? If you're trained as a physicist, if you work as a physicist, how do you approach the world? Like as I'm walking through the, the amazing vistas that Iceland has to offer, as we're all doing it, we all have our individual thoughts and, and recollections and, and we're noticing things. And what do I notice as a physicist? How am I thinking about what Iceland has to present to me? So to think like a physicist, there are three easy steps that you can all follow. Step number one to think like a physicist is to ask simple questions. All of physics, through hundreds of years, is all motivated by asking incredibly simple questions of nature. How does this work? How heavy is that thing over there? Why does this do that? Very simple questions. Not easy questions, but they're very simple questions. So when we're confronted with a situation, when we see something, we ask the most simplest question we can, and we start from there. And then to start building our answer, we start at the beginning. We go to what we call first principles. What is the simplest thing you can say? What is the absolute starting assumption, the most raw observation you can make to build your answer? And you go from there. So every physics paper starts with an introduction, going back, building the case until you get to your advancement. Every conversation, every problem that we try to solve starts from first principles, from the beginning. So ask simple questions, start from the beginning to build your case, and then once you have your answer, once you've built your case, now that you understand a physical system, look for the connections. Because one of the most wonderful things about physics is that it's universal. The same physics that apply here on Earth apply across the universe. So if you can understand something in one situation, if you understand the fundamental forces and energies involved in one situation, you can apply it. You can copy that solution all across the universe. And I'll give you some examples of that. And so my, my simple question, when I'm here standing in Iceland, my very simple question that I'm going to start from today is, why is Iceland so warm? Now that may seem ridiculous because we're locked inside from a blizzard, but if you remember like yesterday, it was kind of nice. And when you flew in, it was kind of nice. And it's much, much more pleasant here in Iceland than it has any right to be. Right? Because we're, uh, you know, here's an image, here's a picture of Iceland in the summer. It, it Don't look outside. Look at the picture. <laughs> this looks glorious. But we're here, we're just south of the Arctic Circle. Little Island, just south of the Arctic Circle. Look at what else is on the Arctic Circle this far north. Northern Canada, the middle of Greenland, northern Alaska, northern Siberia. Frozen tundra wastelands. And yet, Iceland is abundant with life. It's capable of supporting large human populations, a major city, a bunch of settlements, industry. Why? Why? I mean, we're so cold. I took this picture in Reykjavik a couple days ago. This is high noon two days ago with the sun barely peeking above the buildings here in February. It ought to be extremely cold all the time. We ought to not even be able to be here this far north. Why is Iceland so warm? Well, in this case, the reason we should be cold is that the sun is at a very, very low angle. We're so high up in latitude that the sun doesn't shine on us very well. We're all the way up north, so we get a really, really oblique angle from the sun, so that's a little bit of sunlight spread over a lot of land and there's not a lot of heating going on. But, first principles. Where can we start? How can we begin to explain this mystery of why Iceland is so warm? Well, it's cold up here, it ought to be incredibly cold up here, but it's warm at the equator, right? The sun is constantly shining directly down onto the equator and onto the tropics, right? The jungles of the world are incredibly hot. So it's hot down there, 
hey, and we know something. We know some physics. We know that if you have a bunch of air and one side is hot and the other side is cold, the hot stuff is going to move. Temperature wants to equalize. Temperatures want to even out. So in the Earth, in the Earth, the heat from the equator that's constantly warm from the sun wants to go to the poles. It wants to equalize. All of Earth's weather, all of Earth's weather is the Earth's attempt to equalize itself from the uneven heating of the sun. Some parts of the Earth get hotter than others, and it's trying to equalize it all out. Now, if the Earth were perfectly static, perfectly flat, not spinning at all, we would have straight line winds coming from the south into the north, from the equator to the north and from the equator to the south, straight. But the Earth is spinning, right? Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, okay, okay, just checking, just checking. We're all on the same page. We all have the same fundamental principles coming into this problem. The Earth is spinning. So the straight lines become curved in a spinning system. And instead of straight lines coming from the equator to the north, we get these massive, what we call gyres, these massive circulation systems, these circles of water and air going around the globe. And so we have warm air coming from the equator, coming up the coast to Cuba, the Gulf Coast, then shooting across the North Atlantic, going into Europe, and heading into Iceland, bringing warm air and warm water up to regions that would otherwise be frozen wastelands. This is what enables Iceland to be so warm. Here's a more detailed picture you can see. We have a current coming off of Africa, goes into the Gulf, loop, Gulf loops around Florida, shoots across the Atlantic, that's the, jets, the Gulf Stream right there, coming up to Northern Europe in Iceland. So the coasts of Iceland are able to maintain a warmer temperature because they're getting a constant delivery of warm water and warm air all the time coming from the equator. So it's a relatively special place. If you put Iceland somewhere else, this exact same massive land somewhere else, it wouldn't get those benefits. That's why Greenland is so much colder than Iceland because that Gulf Stream misses it even though it's the exact same latitude. So is, in so much of the weather effects we see here are driven by this Gulf current, this warm air coming from the equator. When, you, when this Gulf air hits somewhere like Ireland, it gets, you get a lot of rain in England, Northern Europe, and Ireland. When it comes to Iceland, it comes in the form of snow because we are farther up north. So there's an incredible amount of snow constantly dumped onto this island. And the snow packs layer upon layer upon layer. Incredible pressure pushes down. And if there's any downward slope anywhere, that snow pack is slowly going to ooze down. A river of ice that we call a glacier. Did all of us see the glacial lagoon? Yes. Yesterday? Yeah, this was a region where one of these massive rivers of ice was finally meeting the sea and then fragmenting and breaking apart and melting back into the ocean. But it's all driven, that moisture that you saw entering the ocean in that bay was generated in the equator and carried via the Gulf Stream northwards, then dropped down onto the landmass of Iceland probably thousands of years ago, and then over the centuries pushed down until it finally meets the sea again, and the circle is complete. So is that it? Is that the total answer to the mystery of why Iceland is so warm? Well, there's another feature of Iceland that's been pointed out to us a lot, and that's the volcanoes, right? But volcanoes are underground. They don't care about gulf streams and precipitation and snowpack. They're just really hot on their own. It's heat coming from the Earth itself. 
there's another reason why Iceland is so warm. And in fact, if you look at a map of Iceland, it is lousy with volcanoes. There's this strip of volcanoes running across the entire island and of active fields. And we know how volcanoes work. We know where the heat comes from to power a volcano. It's not from the sun, but it's from the core of the earth itself. The core, the interior of the earth is incredibly hot, molten. This heat doesn't come from the sun. It comes from two sources. There's two reasons why the interior of the earth is so hot. One is it's leftover heat from the formation of the earth itself. Four and a half billion years ago, there was no earth. There was just a big ball of gas and dust swirling around the young proto-sun and it collapsed, it congealed, glued itself together to become a planet. When you have a big giant cloud of gas and you squeeze it down, it heats up. That generates heat. It became a very hot thing. And then slowly over eons, it can cool off. But it's very inefficient, it's very slow. So there's still leftover heat from an earth that formed four and a half billion years ago that's still cooling off, still keeping the interior hot. And there's another source of heat. That when the earth was formed out of the protostellar disk that formed our own solar system, there was oxygen, silicon, carbon, some water, you know, all the usual stuff. There was also radioactive elements, seeded, dusted, throughout that young solar system. Uranium, plutonium, radioactive potassium. This, these radioactive elements decay, natural decay. When a radioactive element decays, it releases some heat. So about half of the Earth's heat, interior heat, is due to radioactive decay. So when you see a volcano, when you see a volcano erupt, or you see a lava field, or you see these, these massive piles of rocks that are deposited all around the shore from these massive titanic explosions, that is powered in part by the formation of the Earth itself four and a half billion years ago, in part from countless radioactive decay events happening within the Earth right now. That is a massive source of energy. That is a massive source of power. And it's literally right underneath our feet. We are on the surface of the Earth. We are practically exposed to space. It's like right there. Like 60 miles, 100 kilometers away is pure vacuum. We're on the edge. Most of the Earth is incredibly hot. And there are places where this heat is able to come all the way up to the crust where we live like in Iceland. And it can power things like volcanoes, where you can have a chamber of magma that keeps spewing itself out onto the surface and building ever, ever higher structures to become a volcano. It can generate hot springs and geysers. When the ground directly underneath this is so hot that any water, any melting snow or rainwater that makes its way through the ground touches hot rocks, magma pools, and escapes as steam or boiling water, comes back right back up to the surface. It's exposed. This energy of the formation of the Earth itself, this energy from the constant nuclear decay happening inside the Earth, are exposed to the surface in a few rare places, like here in Iceland.